We are all told that we need to reduce our energy consumption and use of natural resources to limit our impact on the environment and curb the effects of climate change. However, the ways in which fossil fuels have enhanced our lives over the last century means that our expectations have been set. Nobody wants regression. In fact, as a society, we expect continuous improvement to our living standards. So to make this work, we need to change how we do things so that what we do and the world around us can remain the same. Better still, decarbonisation will actually improve our everyday lives in ways we never hear about. To find out how, I'm talking with two people that have heavily informed the thinking behind our policies in terms of both the purposes and the processes for change. Dr. Paul Dean, Senior Research Fellow at the Marius Centre in UCC, and Paddy Phelan, CEO of the Three County Energy Agency and President of the Irish Bioenergy Association. I'm Paddy Finn, and this is the Electricity Exchange. Paul, Paddy. So displacement from homes, loss of livelihoods and global food shortages. The outcomes of climate change sound a lot like the outcomes of war. And I guess those who are worst affected can often do least about it. Uh, so it's really up to the causers to make the change. So I'm interested to learn about Ireland. Where does Ireland feature on that spectrum between causer or consequent? Yeah, you know, it's a, such a serious challenge, Paddy. And in Ireland, we have a very strange relationship with energy and climate. There's a thing that I think a psychologist or psychiatrist called uh, called uh, cognitive dissonance. It's, it's kind of a strange ability to be able to hold two different conflicting ideas in our mind, but to be comfortable with that. And kind of at a social level and almost at a national level, we have that with climate and energy in Ireland. You know, we, we project this image abroad. We tell everyone how green and clean we are. And in many ways we are. We have some, some great success stories, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but actually, when you step back and look at our, our emissions, for example, you know, the main causes of climate change. Uh, now, at a, at a global level, Ireland's contribution to, to global climate change is relatively small, but that is in essence just a, a coincidence of our geography. We're a small country, we're a small island nation, we don't have a lot of people. But actually, if we look at the consequences of our social and economic activity, if you look at what, what we do as people, we are one of the largest greenhouse gas producers per person in Europe. And if everybody in the world lived like we do in Ireland, the world would already be about three degrees warmer. So we have a really, we don't have a very positive story to tell when we look at all our greenhouse gas emissions on a, on a, on a per person basis. And that's disappointing. But then if we step back and look at the other element of transition we're talking today, energy and energy security. Again, we tell people that we're green and clean, but actually today, uh, you know, we're, we're going to spend about 20 million euros importing fossil fuel into Ireland. We are one of the most fossil fuel dependent countries in Europe, but over 80, uh, about 85, 87% of all our energy last year comes from fossil fuels at an incredible expense. And as you're saying, you know, we, 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 we tend not to see that money leaving the country, but we see the consequences of stuff that's happening outside the country now very much, uh, you know, very present in our energy bills, in our electricity bills, in our heating bills, in our transport bills. So Ireland is not immune at all from the climate change risks. We're not, we're very much exposed when it comes to energy security risks. And we're very much part of the problem uh, in Ireland. You know, we, 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 we can't talk our way out of it. We are, we're very much embedded in it, how we live, how we produce our energy, how we produce our food is very much part of the global challenge. And these are the things that we need to look at it very seriously in Ireland. And what are, like, what are the effects that we're seeing now? So. You know, I know when I was when I was much younger and I was hearing about the impacts of climate change, it sounded quite notional. But, you know, we've started to see what were once in a century weather events become one in a decade weather events and so forth. So what is the world experiencing at the moment as a result of climate change and where does this trend go to? Yeah, that's a really good point, isn't it? Like we all we often thought of climate change in something. You know, it's something you see happening to other people on TV, uh, but we see now it's actually coming much closer to home. We see the consequences of those events that happen on TV kind of rippling out to our own shores in terms of energy prices and food risks and climate risks. And even just looking around the world today at the moment, look at extreme weather. The weather is unfortunately getting weirder. It's getting more extreme uh, and that's causing a lot of you know, infrastructural damage. And while we don't particularly experience a lot of those direct 
implications in Ireland at the moment, we do get the secondary effects. You know, we're seeing that in in in, in food costs, we're seeing it in energy costs. So um, that's one of the difficulties that we're that we're that we're seeing in Ireland at the moment. That it's not just stuff that's happening on TV anymore. It's coming closer to our shores, and we're starting to live it and see it every day. And we we have seen the global effects for a long time, but we're definitely seeing a lot more local effects now. And people are local in their thinking, so that's really what stimulates change. So what have you seen, Paddy, I guess, as part of 3CEA that yeah, I, highlights I, that? I suppose, as, as Paul alludes to there, when you look at it at the local level, I suppose climate change and energy security, uh, it's something that has always been there. We just have to accept that. Uh, starting to see, as you've touched upon, the impacts coming much closer to us. But when you look at the energy security piece, particularly, and you consider climate change, so, you know, when we look around us, we're a very resourceful nation. And when we see something, and we're all very good at it, in an individual and citizen basis, that you know we see something, quite often we're quite good at making use of it. So, fundamentally, at a local level, the opportunity exists, you know, to become energy independent, whether that's from onshore, offshore, uh, bioenergy, you know, all of the media that are there for us to use technology going forward. So, I think in the longer term, uh, we have the opportunity, we have the capacity. Um, I think very fundamental level to break it right down to individuals and citizens. So all of us around this table here having a conversation today, um, very grateful for you to, to have us in today, Paddy, on this discussion. But I think fundamentally, we have to make it simpler for people to be able to act. You know, that's at every level, whether it's the homeowner, you know, even the dependent child within a home, right up to the large scale renewable energy company that wants to develop projects in Ireland. Every step of that way, it's very complex, very hard to grasp. Well, what do you mean I have to do this to get that? Or why do I have to wait this long to achieve that? Um, and, you know, that's at the, the large scale renewables or even bioenergy projects. But if you take it to the homeowner, the individual, the school child, you know, the simplest ideas are often not capitalized upon. Why are we making this so difficult? in our everyday living. If, for example, it's taken us so long, look at rooftop solar on a home. I mean, the opportunity around it uh, to provide a little piece of the puzzle in the context of energy security. It's not going to be lost. It's not going to be wasted. It's going to participate or contribute in a small little way. And then that person is bought in. They've done a bit of the work themselves. So they're not periphery to this. It's not something that they can't contribute towards. And then building up that scenario so we get people engaged. And I think for us as an energy agency, we've identified that, you know, you've touched on the challenges around resources, around people, around, you know, technical capacity to, to overcome this at a local level. But I mean, every day we all do things that if we knew more about, we could do less of. And that's the energy efficiency piece. that We could all use a little bit less. And that over time, if we build that behavior and, you know, give people the capacity to understand, well, if I drive a little bit less this month, done something. That's very positive and very powerful. Uh, and people will, uh, you know, as a sense, buy into that. But at the moment, it does appear very complex and it does appear extremely challenging. And all of the conversations probably around how difficult this is, as opposed to what a great opportunity this is for Ireland, you know, long into the future. And I think that's one of the things I share with you there, Paddy. It's one of the things we've seen over the last two years in particular, you know, it's always tricky, isn't it, to talk to people about climate change because you can see greenhouse gases, but you can see the inter, you know the consequences of it on the TV. But the current energy crisis has brought it right home. And as you said, Paddy, there's there's a huge uh, interest and a frustration as well in many in many behalves. You know, as I said, you know, we're like we're twenty million euros every day for a country that's so rich in 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 our ability to produce energy, to save energy, to grow energy. Uh, you know, for such a smart country, that's a really silly position to be in. So I think there's a rising frustration out there within the public uh, who are always kind of interested and aware of climate change, but could never make that tangible connection. But now is that we're seeing the consequences of these things in our bills. When you open up your your, your electricity bill every two months now, you know, it's it's when you drive past a petrol station, uh, you know, we you fill your, 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 your kerosene, our home heating tank, your constant reminder of how exposed we are in Ireland uh, to international events and how reliant we are on fossil fuels. Like when we chat to people and we say, you know, it's it's almost 90% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. They're almost floored, you know, and they say, well, what about the 
the huge potential that we have here, but we're just not trapping into it. So we certainly are seeing a kind of a, a pivot in the last, uh, certainly year or two, very clearly in the last couple of months, where there's a rising awareness of the connection between energy and climate change, our exposure to it and cost. It's hitting us in our pockets and it's, uh, and it's, it's probably hitting us where it hurts most. But there's two big time sensitivities around this. So I suppose it's, there's three elements. We have we have climate change, we have resource depletion when you look at the peak oil report, and then we have the um, uh, international volatility in energy markets hitting price as well. And in terms of the time sensitivity, there's clearly we need to address climate change soon. We need to address it early before it's irreversible um, because that's something that you can't just invest in after that point to try to get it right. You know, you have to do it now. But also in terms of the actual ability to become renewable, because in order for us to build the new renewable resources at this point in time, we need fossil fuels to um, to fuel the extraction of the raw materials that we're using to, to build the renewable resources. And it's not just a case that we ha- we uh, that that becomes a problem when they're depleted. They just have to be too expensive for us to do it. So um, it's I think you know any perception that we can drain the oil wells dry and it's after the last drop that we can actually do something. We need what remains and what remains economically viable for us to extract. We need that to use that now in order to facilitate the new renewable transition. I think if you even take that even a step further back. So it's a very good analogy to, you know, the last drop of oil is gone. Okay, switch over. You know, wouldn't be a particularly uh, good solution as we'd all appreciate in terms of you know, then. But even now that we know we've had 2020 targets, we have now 2030 targets. But even the 2020 targets, we didn't deliver. Um, we did well in some places and we didn't do so well in others across the various energy media, energy demand sectors. But if we even analyze all of these people that, you know, Paul has touched on at the local level, you know, whether it's a homeowner or a business or, you know, two school teachers, you know, the, the center of where we are are having these conversations around their table at breakfast before they go to work. You know, how are we going to pay the bills? You know, that this is, this is, you know, really set home in everyday conversations. But if you just analyze that and think about, we've been at this for a long time um, and people will ask us tomorrow, well, what's the solution? Now we know, you know, what the potential solutions are, but we can't take people there just now because of legislation, planning, you know, restrictions, or, you know, as we, as we, as we have experienced, all of us, the, the element of resistance, you know, there is a significant, and you mentioned the, the two opposite polar ends of the spectrum of, we know it's a problem, but we really are okay with that problem because if it ends up in our backyard, we don't want it. You know, and that idea of trying to get people to understand that you know, the contrary situation of the oil is gone and then we can switch over is not an option. You know, even at this point, we're saying we didn't achieve our targets in 2020 and they've got so much stiffer for 2030. We certainly have to now start accepting responsibility as individuals right around the world, but particularly at local levels, to understand that there is a way we will get there all need to play our part and you know, it's not a case that we all can let it happen over there away from our own homes and our own backyards we all now have to accept that we can all participate and some of the community programs that are out there are so innovative and so you know well considered in terms of their policy and opportunity for people to get involved without having to have lots of money or having you know time is something that's very valuable in this space uh, but fundamentally market actions like cost, the inflation that's come in the past few months, you know, they're all making it more difficult right at this moment in time. So whilst people are realizing that it's a huge issue, they're not very well empowered to be able to do anything about it. But yeah, and but on the plus side, you know, because it can seem overwhelming. Like you, you mentioned the three the three problems, Fadi, on climate change, energy security and price volatility. Like the good news from a policy perspective, the solution is the same. There's three problems, one solution. And that solution actually goes way beyond reducing emissions. Like when you look at the, you know, when you look at the the stuff that we have to do to meet those three goals, there's many other core benefits or side benefits that are actually main benefits for for lots of people. You know, we've we have a situation in Ireland as well. We've got, you know, we've got huge emissions, huge reliance on fossil fuels. 
But we also have about 1,300 people who will die prematurely this year um, because of poor air pollution. It primarily comes from home heating systems, and primarily from homes that leak most of their energy, um, primarily from families who have to spend way more heat in their homes because so much is leaked out into the outside. And that puts people in a position of fuel poverty. We have 400,000 families in Ireland at the moment who struggle to meet their energy bills. That's ridiculous for a country that's so rich. And, you know, if you turn the problem upside down and say, well, how can we reduce those deaths from air pollution? How can we reduce uh, energy poverty? How can we reduce these soaring costs that we're seeing at the moment? The answer is actually moving away from fossil fuels. And the core benefit of uh, almost a coincidence of doing the things that you need to do to address climate change is really good for society. So reducing emissions means increasing well-being and welfare for people. If you're living in a damp house, you know, with kids, you know, young kids in a damp house and you're heating it with with solid fuel or, or with, with poor quality timber or with, with, you know, expensive kerosene or whatever, that's not good for, for you mentally or physically in the home. You know, you might, you know, you're, you're, you're struggling with, 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 with health solutions or with missing days off work. So giving people dignified living conditions where you live in a house that doesn't cost a fortune to eat, that is cozy, uh, good quality air, good quality ventilation, that's a really good thing for the person in the house, it's good for the planet. And also, there's huge employment opportunities here as well. One of the other problems when you import so much energy into this country, we have so few people working in energy uh, in this country. Okay, look, the three of us are on the table are. But, you know, if you look at countries like uh, uh, like France or Norway, where, you know, huge swathes of the population are working in the energy sector. And that's an opportunity that Ireland has missed because we've outsourced that, that those employment opportunities to the co- countries that we, imp- we import from. So when I think about all the problems that we're looking at today, I think about solutions. We know what the solution is, but that solution will lead to many other benefits. You know, so increased business opportunities, employment, better air quality, better opportunities for farmers, which we'll talk about later. So, and in many ways, when you step back at it and, you, you know, there's been a resistance, I suppose, over the last couple of years, people saying, well, climate action is expensive and we don't want to do it. But we now know that climate inaction is more expensive. And it's something that we have to do. And financial stress has so much impact on the quality of people's lives. It really does. And I guess it is a huge concern for people who are experiencing financial stress that those who are in power are shielded from a lot of those stresses and don't know what what that feels like. And, uh, you know, I suppose when we then look at energy is at the source of so many of the drivers behind our cost of living. So energy is behind food production, energy is behind um, the construction industry, energy is behind um, our ability to heat our homes, etc. So if we tackle energy, we make it renewable from low cost renewable sources. It isn't just the energy we're tackling. I guess that's the key point that you're making, right? Is that it's not just the energy we're tackling, it's all aspects because the objective here is to enhance quality of life. Exactly. Uh, I I think even just on that topic, you know, to put a tangible example of it in place. And uh, back in 2013, we were involved with uh, one of the local authorities in retrofitting an entire fuel poor, you know, heavily populated uh, social housing scheme in Kilkenny, one of the oldest schemes built in the country. Um, And 250 metres away was the the medical centre. You know, so um, in the discussion, a lot of the houses retrofit to a very high energy standard uh, back in 2013. You know, you could visibly see, number one, that people were more comfortable with, you know, a better standard of living in terms of quality of home and comfort. That's obvious. But in real terms, uh, many of those would have been in uh, possession of um, medical cards and therefore, you know, would have had free access to medical care and therefore up and down to their local, usually very regular basis, you know, Immediately, it was identified that straight after that, that their number of visits per year had reduced. So, if you just you know factor that up as an individual basis per citizen, and the cost of you know that medical insurance, medical costs around medical cards, and so on and so forth. I mean, that money alone, if it was rerouted, you know, save it and reroute it, or you know, the, the, the natural effect of you know more comfort, less coughs, less colds. Um, I mean. We can become a very effective, efficient society with, you know, the best of healthcare. We're constantly hearing in the media about the cost of healthcare. The reality is a lot of what we're talking about comes from that energy that we speak yeah. or lack of it yeah. or poor use of it. And maybe one of the things you've seen, Paddy, like what I suppose, and this comes, it's a, it's a, it's a thing I've, I've always struggled with when it comes to climate change and how we talk about it and how we communicate it. And the problem comes from kind of my side of the house on the, the scientific academic side. 
we tell people it's about the planet, but actually, it, it, yes, it is. But it, it's actually about people. You know, it's about improving people's lives. And I think, and we're we're kind of like a broken record in many regards when it comes to climate change. And we talk about you know, and all the stuff that's true and real. But you know, like like uh, melting ice sheets and, and the planet. But it's difficult for most people to make tangible connections with that. You know, but as Paddy said, if you're talking about the neighbor down the road who's burning cold or peach and it's going out into the air and you walk past a house, you take a big mouthful of air of, of, of dirty air comes into your lungs. They are problems that we can all relate to and they're local, they're relevant and they're the things that get us socially and politically motivated, you know, and they're very helpful, you know, uh, and I think talking about climate change in a way that's relevant for other people is a very helpful thing and moving away from, and it's not that the narrative isn't true. It, it is true. You know, the climate change is a huge problem for the planet and for the uh, ice caps and glaciers and all of this. But talking about stuff that people can relate to, you know, we know that talking about climate change in that way for the last 30 years isn't working. Emissions are rising and people just feel disempowered. So you know, talking about people is a real, is, is a real uh, important part of that solution as well. And when we talk about it not being tangible, it's very tangible now where we've seen the, the, the crisis in the war with the war in Ukraine leads to an energy crisis here that I think has really drawn a link for us now between uh, energy security and national sovereignty. Yeah. And again, these are all various facets of the same problem yeah. um, that, that we're tackling. So people now are definitely feeling the near term pinch of the of the of the fuel crisis. And I really think that it's, we, you know, we're only at the unfortunately at the start of some of this, um, because the reality is, you know, that, that there was an expectation for next winter that there was going to be a second gas line from from uh, Russia to Germany. Uh, future trades would have taken place on the assumption that that was going to be there. And, you know, uh, I guess our entire energy landscape has changed in a very short period of time where everything in the back end now has to try to change, to try to make up for it. But that's resulting in electricity electricity and yep. gas customers getting really hard hit by this. So when we then start looking at what are the potential solutions out there? And I, I guess there isn't a one size fits all in terms of the solutions that can be brought to bear because we have multiple sectors to tackle and multiple sectors that need to play a different role in how this problem is solved. So we have a residential side, we have agriculture, we have transport, we have industrial. Um, so uh, when we look at, I suppose it's the question that you said you, you get asked all of the time, um, but even if we were to assume that none of the obstacles were there that currently exist, because I guess that's, a, that's one of the big challenges of not having an answer, this would be a great option. But so if we were to take away some of the, the buts, what, what are the great options available to the various sectors? Yeah, well, I mean, across all sectors, electricity is available and it's connected to, you know, every building in the built environment um, has, has an electricity connection. Um, so that's a great opportunity. It's going to be a great part of the solution. Um, and, you know, increasing the percentage of energy consumed, uh, doubling that up with, you know, improving our energy efficiency. So making the amount of energy we need in, in the round uh, less, um, you know, renewable electricity is, you know, key to this. And, and it's important to note that through the pandemic and, and we're all fresh from COVID, whilst we were all at home locked up and not being able to move and an awful lot of the economy was locked up, uh, a lot of the renewable production continued. You know, we kept our homes and lights heated and lights on. And, you know, it, it's a very robust uh, economic strategy to transfer to renewables and have energy security, you know, not to, to harp back on that. But in, in a sense, you know, the most economically advantageous is, is renewables. We saw, you know, we saw wind in Ireland drop below the price of gas there about three or four years ago. So you often hear some of the, you know, the negative uh, columnists talking about, you know, the cost of renewables and, you know, it's more expensive than, you know, when it's been subsidized by and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But we're, we're in a new era now. So the new era is that, you know, the market price is such that it's costing as you've touched on. So electricity is immediately connected. And then, but we fully must appreciate that electricity cannot do it all. It certainly can't do it all by 2030. And it probably cannot do it all by 2050. So I think we'd all agree that that's probably a fact. So therefore, we need to look at the other media that are out there. So we're all very familiar with bioenergy. And bioenergy is something that the art gives us naturally through photosynthesis. It's going to be naturally more expensive than electricity, you know, renewables, because the wind blows, you don't have to bring the fuel to it. Solar, you don't have to bring the sun to it. It just happens by 
by nature. So naturally, they're going to lead the way in terms of cost. But we have to accept that we can continue to pay for fossil. So we have to get the balance right then on the other bits. So if we look at bioenergy, so double cropping and tillage is a really interesting opportunity without going down the agriculture rabbit hole right now. Um, but if you bring these um, carbon sequestration crops in through clovers and, you know, turnips and all these aspects of, you know, better tillage, you know, there's a second crop that's available for potential anaerobic digestion and you can still keep food going. So you don't have this food versus energy debate, which has gone on for decades now at this point. We need both. We need energy. We need food. That's the reality. So let's, you know, let them work together. So there's a real practical example of, uh, you know, improving our lot in terms of climate and another media, which is, which is biomass. I mean, we mentioned timber, uh, forestry, it's very renewable. You know, you can get all sorts of different varieties of, of bioenergy from fast growing to slow growing. Um, and again, working those in the timber industry, so your high value products, your low value products, and you're getting to your pulp wood. Um, and also, you know, recycling. So, you know, all the opportunities around uh, stuff that we have anyway, it's lying around on the ground. Um, you know, the analogy I thought was a brilliant one. People say, oh, burning trees, you're ruining, you're ruining, you're ruining the universe. You're destroying carbon. When that tree falls in the wood, it's going to decay and emit that carbon regardless. You know, over its time, it has to. That's and it's collected in the first place. And it's collected. Recently. So, so therefore, you know, we're, we're, we're to cycle it. You know, the, the, the circular economy is something that we really just have to appreciate. And then other media. So what other stuff do we use every day that we could make alongside energy? So one touched on recently, it was in Europe at a project. And they mentioned that, you know, one of the biggest challenges in agriculture, again, and not to harp on agriculture, but I'm, I'm coming from a rural region, southeast, which is, you know, heavily agriculture dependent. They're using a lot of ammonia at the moment, you know, they're using a lot of urea fertilizer and it's made from fossil fuels and it's generally brought from, you know, Russia or Ukraine. You know, could we produce it? We used to produce it, but could we produce it as a, as an energy vector? You know, could we use electricity to produce it here and store energy in that format and then convert it back into electricity if we need it? But as a byproduct, then we'd have locally produced. That's really interesting in relation to agriculture. So not just looking at how it reduces the carbon intensity of its own activities, but changing its activities to help other sectors to become uh, lower carbon as well. And I saw a very interesting case recently that's been looked at by one of our clients. Uh, so they have a large fruit and veg growing operation and they have a combined heat and power plant to give them heat for the greenhouses, but also the CO2 from the engine is used by the plants to grow. So at least it's, it's absorbed there locally. And uh, we're talking with them about the idea of potentially using some of their organic waste for an anaerobic digester. So it would basically take the, uh, the old, any old decaying stock uh, into the anaerobic digester to produce electricity, but also quite, and heat, but also quite a unique one in their use case is the CO2, yeah. which then goes forward to actually feed the, the next generation of and plants. It's particularly interesting, um, Northern European countries that have been really good at this and okay, they've naturally had a, a very strong resource of, of biomass and, and forestry, you know, in those Nordic countries. But if you look at Sweden, I remember visiting Sweden in 2010 to Växjö, the city of Växjö, and city 58 kilometers down the road, Lungby. So two mayor sets got together, you know, made a decision, okay, Lungby was going to build the incinerator, that's the energy, district heating was the vector for the heat. Electricity was then produced, you know, CHP, high efficiency. And in, in Vecchio, which is a bigger city, but they're, you know, probably two thirds uh, the population was in Vecchio and one third in Lungby, uh, they decided they'd focus on the bioenergy resource. So they built a district heating, which was going to be supplied by bioenergy. So the deal was struck. So all the waste from Vecchio goes to Lungby. And all the bioenergy resource from Lungby, you know, brown bean waste, all that sort of stuff comes to Vecchio. You know, the resources are there yeah. if we can exchange them um, and then it brings a value, you know, so that's all local economy that's reduced import of fossil fuels. And, you know, it'll very much complement the production of wind and solar. So when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, you're still producing waste. And as long as you're collecting it in a very efficient and scale, at a scale that works, you know, we can do this. They have done it. I mean, but, you know, it, in many ways, Paddy, like, it, you know, we do a lot of kind of, I suppose, complex thinking, you know, being an academic, we, well, we like to promote as complex thinking, I suppose, in UCC about the future. But essentially, when you step back from it, you know, there's a very simple principle. Every country should just play to its strengths, you know, when it comes to energy transitions. You know, uh, coming, in here, coming in here today, actually, 
I was just checking the news and we saw today that Russia has cut off gas to Finland. It won't matter for Finland, actually, because Finland have such a low reliance on natural gas. It's less than 5%. Finland are actually very unusual, actually, Petty, and you like this. Finland are, or maybe you probably noticed already, Petty, Finland are the only country in Europe, actually, that its primary source of energy is renewable. Uh, they have huge forestry resources in Finland, and that 30% of all their energy, primary energy, comes from forestry, comes from bioenergy, uh, for industry, for the residues, for the wastes, uh, for the... And they've built an industry around that. They've built a society around that. And again, they're, they're playing to their strengths. Oil is their secondary uh, um, 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 energy source, which, is very, which makes them very strange at a global level. And again, if you take that lesson and look at Ireland, what are we good at? You know, we're, we've got loads of wind. We've got huge oceans. You know, we've got enough sunshine, you know, even though, uh, through certain months of the year. We've got we've got a, a, an incredibly active ecosystem to grow uh, to grow uh, biogas to grow fast rotation co- crops. So when you stand back and look at what you have and you see where you need to go, then you can start thinking about well, what solutions are you looking at? And and, and as you said, Patty, very clearly, you know, wind, onshore, offshore, solar, and then wrap and wrap wrapping the bioenergy economy around that. They're the things we're really good at in Ireland. You know, we've got smart people working in the energy industry. We need more of them. And we've got incredibly smart farmers and smart agricultural people working in the uh, with land who 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 can deliver those solutions. And we really need to amplify those solutions. So rather than looking abroad for new pipelines, as you said, from Russia to Germany or whatever, just look 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 around our own house, look around our own our own country. What are we good at? And then what do we need to do then to bring those energy routes to market? And then of course, how quickly can we do it? There's a big challenge there as well. I think a lot of this is dealt with as in, as discrete single issues and not dealt with effectively then. And I was quite shocked to learn recently that there is more waste heat dumped into the River Liffey uh, by industries uh, than the actual heating requirement for Dublin. And that's that's quite a shocking stat. And it actually really highlights that point. You're saying that that the solutions are there. We We have what we need and it's about the joined up thinking. And Paul, really interested to hear from your view around policy. Um, so when you look at policy changes that are needed, uh, you must see that a lot of the opportunity actually exists within system thinking and the joining of dots that are already there. Exactly, Paddy. And it's kind of that lesson about just, you know, just kind of taking a breather, stepping back and looking at what you have, seeing where you need to go and just making them talk to each other, making them work, you know. I suppose within a, within a policy context, it's quite exciting within Ireland at the moment. Ireland has announced, I suppose, last year, and they're going through the Oireachtas at the moment, uh, one of the most, I suppose, ambitious climate action policies in the world. Now, the challenge with Ireland has always been, we've all been very good at ambition. We haven't been very good at delivering on it. Uh, but what we need now to do is deliver on it. And that's helpful because when you start at the end game looking at emissions, you think, you, you know, you're, you're not singularly focusing on electricity or heat or transport. You're looking at, at our emissions bubble and you're trying to re- reduce them. And that allows us then to think about interactions between electricity, heat and transport and agriculture. So I think finally we're getting there in regard to that systems thinking at a, at a national level in Ireland. The big challenge there then is just connecting it all up. Uh, and traditionally we haven't been good at that. You know, we tend, as you said, we tend to uh, inherit this silo thinking about well, heat or for the is for the heat people, and the transport is a transport problem. But they're not; they're they're actually interlinked. Um, and particularly with electricity, electricity will, you know, it's, it's electricity. I suppose essentially is the thing that we are. It's our biggest potential to produce. You know, that's our greatest strength here in Ireland, and that should become the foundation that we build our future economy and future society on. Uh, and then the rest of it is 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 actually just getting electricity into the economy. And a big challenge that we have with electricity at the moment is that most things today don't use electricity. You know, so we're here today and we're, we've got lights and computers and whatever, and most appliances use electricity. But if you pop outside in the street here, you know, you've got cars, trucks, planes, buses, heating systems that don't yet use electricity. So we like to say, look, we need to put more plugs on things, you know, get, get, uh, get electrified transport, electrified heating. And that takes, that takes time. But it also takes a lot of this cross-institutional policy thinking that we're just starting to get used to uh, in Ireland. And it means you've got to connect the national picture to the county level, to the community level, to the family level, you know, and I suppose that's what is interesting in your work as well, Paddy, looking to, looking at the at the community level is how can you bring all those together? Yeah, and, you know, frustratingly, I suppose, uh, and, and we have to speak about the past, frustratingly, I, I'll use the example of, um, you know, involved in looking at the feasibility of a district heating system for Nina. So Nina is a rural town with a big population and it had a, a big heat demand in the middle, which was the creamery. Arabon Co-op, um, and, you know, to that point about waste heat, they had waste heat available. 
So we did a detailed study under some EU funding back in 2009, 2010, where we looked at linking the you know, co-op to the hospital, to the civic buildings, and then looking at a few housing estates where there was a dense population. And uniquely, one of the housing estates was you know, quite unique in density sense that most housing estates we drive into have houses on the perimeter and a green area in the middle. This housing estate had houses on both sides. So the cost of putting the pipe down the middle was halved because you had double the customers either side. So we did all that detailed assessment and we made a very strong lobby to go, right, let's get some district heating. Local authority pretty much behind it. But politically, um, it, was, it was amazing. Gas networks came to town. Politically, decision was made. But fundamentally, the political will at a local level, you know, was looking at this short-term gain. You know, we get gas, we secure gas, you know, run the system rather than heavy fuel oil, because gas was cheaper. You know, so now that decision, and I bring it back to the Vectro example, where the mayor decided back in 1999, okay, we're moving away from fossil. We're investing in a district heating system and we're putting in the ring main. They're quite good at it here in Dublin. Kodima with the local authorities have been looking at this for a long time. I suppose like in many ways, like when you're thinking about energy transitions, Paddy, you know, you don't need, well, particularly for the short to medium term, we don't need new technologies in Ireland. We need new, we need new thinking. You know, we need to, and I, I think a thing that we need a lot is just to improve the energy and climate literacy of our public representatives. And, and it's not that they need to tell the difference between a petajoule and a gigajoule or whatever, but just to be able to see where energy fits within the wider society, just make the connections between, you know, your your electricity, your your transport, your heating, and how it impacts not just on your bill, but how it impacts on, pe- on people. So I think different ways of thinking, expanding our, our views that energy isn't just a, a terajoule or a gigajoule, that there's a person, that there's a, you know, there's a community, there's a, there's a business opportunity there. And then connecting those dots, you know, uh, from biodiversity to environmental issues, to emissions. And that's kind of one of the strengths, I suppose, you know, that the, the Scandinavians and the Nordic countries have done, that they don't look at these things in isolation, that they are able to appreciate the bigger picture and make those connections. Part of that, I think, will come through education. We're seeing, you know, planning authorities getting a lot more active. Um, and we're seeing schools. You know, we do a lot of talking in, in, in primary schools and secondary schools. And thankfully, you know, those kids are going to be smarter than we are. You know, they, they're, they have green schools. You know, they won't tolerate the same stuff that, uh, that we have. And they have a much greater understanding. They have a, and they have a wonderful literacy. And uh, almost a, you know, a very intuitive to make these connections between what's happening in nature, what's happening in energy and what's happening across society. So we just need to get that thinking that's very prevalent in a lot of the primary schools. And, and it's come from the great work of uh, uh, Antashka and the Green Flags programs, getting that into the, the agencies, getting it into the institutions and getting it into the utilities now. I, it's, I think it's, it's the decision makers. It's the decision makers that really we need to identify. And, and you know, all of that work we're doing now, you know, we do it at a local level with schools, educating. They will be the decision makers of the future. But I don't think we should give up on the decision makers of today. Sometimes the decision is, okay, let's train the younger people so when they get there, they, they default make the better decision. I think there's a huge opportunity. So we, for example, run an annual um, CBD day for all the elected members in the counties that we work in. And they just come and they see some interesting projects and they understand. But they learn a bit more afterwards. And year on year, we see more of the elected members at a local level coming to us asking us questions. That's brilliant. That, that, that's questions they never asked before. So they, they want to know. They want to, they want to understand. But unfortunately, I think what you find with local politics, and this is the difference between us and Sweden. In Sweden, they have fiscal control in their city. They make their own budgets, they decide their own income, and they fundamentally make their own investments. Whereas in Ireland, everything is centre and it's, it's top down. So to make those decisions needs the entire country to get. So, you know, the issue we have is that you know, local elected representatives are getting voted under different criteria than actually can make a difference. So fundamentally, if there's a very localized issue that's caused a bit of a storm, then a politician has to be seen on the right side of that storm or his, his livelihood is at risk. Versus, you know, at a European context, when you look at these municipalities and how they design and decide, the mayor is elected, he's full fiscal control for seven years and he can get re-elected. So you can potentially, like the president of Ireland, you could have 14 years of a good or bad decision maker and fundamentally the mayor makes the decision. And they have that kind of autonomy to do it. In Ireland, I think unfortunately, we don't have that autonomy and everything gets decided at central level. and It takes the entire system to change for decisions to actually filter down. So I think 
We are slightly disadvantaged in that sense, but I think going back to your point, we can educate and we can make the decision makers more informed when they make those decisions. We've also seen though as well, I think back to a previous point, that silver bullets or what seem like silver bullets, uh, particularly if they have a nice snappy narrative as to how it's a solution, uh, tend to trump the more complex solutions that are actually closer to being silver bullets. Um, so if we look back, probably if we didn't discover um, the Conseil gas field, um, we would probably have higher degree of energy independence now and and lower energy costs right now. But of course, you know, we the, the view would have been, and I suppose rightly so at the time in the economic situation, that we needed to capitalize on, on the resource that's there. But as we tried to move forward, everything that you've said, I was almost expecting that there was going to be some real detractor amongst um, the, the solutions available. Uh, generally, if you have a solution that can give three potential outcomes, you generally say you can have any two of the three. Um, but with everything that we've talked about, they, it covers so many areas of improving people's lives, enhancing our economy, giving us uh, security and independence. But it comes back to the, 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 the blockers that, um, that are stopping us from getting there. Um, and if we look towards, we're not just aiming towards 2030 now, we're aiming towards net zero, we're, we're aiming beyond that. Um, so I'd be very keen to get each of your views as to what, what does the system look like? What's the customer experience? What's the energy makeup of the country um, at that point in time uh, when we're kind of working towards net zero? Yeah, and, and like there are no game changers, there are no silver bullets, it's a lot of hard work, but it is worthwhile, as you said, you know, when we think about the future, in many ways, I see the future has been very similar mm -hmm. to today, you know, we still, if you want to move from A to B, you'll hop into a square box and it'll be powered by electricity or hydrogen or something, I, who cares, mm -hmm. as long as it's, as long as it's clean, and as long as there's, there's no emissions. So I think there's, there's a, there's a dangerous narrative sometimes that kind of, that kind of compels people into thinking that we need to go back to stone age and we won't be able to do this or that. There will be things that we won't be able to do, you know, until the technology becomes available and we will have to reduce our consumption. Our current levels of consumption right across the planet, particularly in the Western world, in modern economies is just not compatible at all with, um, uh, with our climate goals. So that there will have to be some pulling back on consumption. But in terms of our normal lives, we'll be very familiar. When you turn on a switch, the lights will still come on, but the electricity will either come from, you know, a, a, from from your roof, from solar farms or from batteries that you've stored or from wind farms or, or, or from whatever. So, and I think most people really, you know, outside of this room here or maybe outside of people listening to this podcast, a lot of people don't really care where their energy or electricity comes from as long as they can do stuff. And in many ways, we'll still be able to do the stuff that we're doing today. Uh, we'll be just doing it with different things, you know, so the electricity won't be coming from money point or from gas, it'll be coming from, you know, God knows where, but it'll be green, green, uh, green, green, uh, green and clean. I think the bigger challenges or bigger opportunities really is wrapped around the agricultural areas in Ireland, you know, and we, for there, we need to distinguish between the policy and the people. Uh, we need to have farmers in Ireland. We need more good farmers, but we are, we are going to have a need for less livestock. And what we need to do is figure out ways we're keeping farmers on farms, but just doing different things. And there's lots of opportunities there around the bioeconomy, around using our soil in very clever ways. So in many ways, Patty, like when I think about the future and think about 2050, I think the air will be cleaner. I think we'll be less exposed to the volatility of energy prices. I think we'll have a healthier population. Hopefully we'll have a less burden of energy on healthiness within our hospitals. Hopefully we'll have more employment. We'll all know friends working in the energy industry because it's a normal thing to do and it becomes normalized. Hopefully we'll be producing more of our energy. Um, so in many ways, I think the future is, is very, it's very bright. It's a very, it's a very necessary future that we need, but it won't all be easy. You know, and as Paddy said, it starts when that, when that politician knocks on your door, you know, whenever that will be. And they say, well, what's important to you? You know, is it, you know, the road getting fixed or, or is it the, or is it the, the economy getting, getting sorted out? And it starts with all of us just taking individual action, talking about the importance of energy, talking about the importance of climate and then moving it on from there. Well, now the question is going to be, what are you doing to reduce my energy costs? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That is and going to be yeah. a key question. Definitely. You know, if you look at the public surveys uh, going on at the moment, you know, in the Sunday newspapers, everyone is worried and rightly so about the price of energy. A typical family in Ireland spends about seven to 8,000 euros a year in energy, but half of that goes into our car, but a quarter into our electricity bill and a quarter into our heat. And unfortunately, if you look at the next two years, that's only going to rise. So we need to address that. If we look at like a lot of the major changes over the last century, 
that were really successful. They were successful because they were seamless, because they allowed people to carry on with an enhancement to what they were doing, but it seamlessly integrated into their lives. And I guess that's where we all come in, is that we're tasked with finding the solutions that sit in the background that actually change what goes on in the background. So from the customer point of view, from the user point of view, it's the same, it's the same or better. And I, this brings us on then to um, discussing the key obstacles. So what really needs to change from a, a policy, a planning perspective in terms of not just national policy, European policy, the whole way right down. Uh, so from European policy right down to, uh, to local communities, what are the key changes that are going to be critical to actually get us there? Yeah, well, a lot of the technologies that, you, you know, the te technology changes that we've seen over the last couple of hundred years have worked as well because they were convenient. They were more convenient. And when we look at the history of transitions, it's not just about cost. That convenience element is a huge, uh, uh, attractive part of it. So for retrofitting your home, it must be convenient. You know, these one-stop shops that are popping up now, they are a really good idea because they make it more convenient. But then wrapping around that is, I think access to finance is a big barrier, I think, for a lot of people. There's a huge enthusiasm and interest and in climate action and energy action at the moment. But a lot of people just don't have access to that cash. And as I said before, it's not just new technologies, it's new ways of thinking. So looking at clever financing, looking at property linked finance, for example, where you link the price of your retrofit, not to the person in the property, but to the lifetime of the property. So you're paying it back over, over 100 years, 120 years, the property is, or whoever is in the property, like we used to do in the old days with the, with the council house building. So I think making it convenient, making it easy for people and making it easy for people to access the financing is really, really fundamentally important. Now, then when you get all that figured out, I think we, we have a trades shortage in Ireland, having the hands to deliver the climate action that we want, the plumbers, electricians and carpentry. So climate action in the future isn't just about, you know, the scientists or the academics like me, it will be delivered by the carpenters, by the electricians. So we need more women and men in trades. That's fundamentally important. I think there are two big barriers that I would lay down there, Paddy, just access of people to deliver it and then the convenience for people who want to access it are barriers that need to be overcome. I, I see, you know, in every challenge and, and climate change is the big challenge, but in every challenge there's an opportunity and we've touched on it very early stage about the resource that lies around us. And how do we capitalize on you know, bringing that forward into the energy system and replace this imported fossil fuel that we've been using for decades? Uh, but going back to the shortage, we see it every day in the energy agency. You know, we've been involved in over 1,200 retrofits as facilitators and, and aggregators to bring capacity together, whether that's with local authority retrofits. And I go back to that example of that housing estate being done in bulk. That made a lot of sense. We did it 10 years ago, but we haven't replicated that so often because of barriers or bureaucracy or the grants you're seeking is too big or, you know, the challenges of the technology. Um, we had resources, you know, nine, 10 years ago because we were after a recession and there was a lot of capacity there in that sector. So we were able to get stuff done. We can't do it today. So, I mean, one-stop shops are, are brilliant and, you know, they're there for the long term. So, you know, everybody over a period of, you know, 10 to 15 years should have the opportunity to easily access. But in the short term, the resources are not there. In the short term, it's taken a bit of time, quite grant dependent. So we've had to think about this internally in the energy agency and go, well, you know, we also want to change people's hearts and minds. So we want people to be able to do something practical about this climate change challenge. And, you know, getting the 60 to 70,000 euro to retrofit your home is not available to everyone. You know, let's be fair. You mentioned fuel poverty earlier. The definition in Europe of fuel poverty is 10% of disposable income spent on energy. So I would argue there could be six, 700,000 homes in Ireland right this month who are in fuel poverty because they're spending more than 10% of their disposable income. That's after mortgage, after food, after, you know, living costs. So we have a big challenge in terms of being able to unlock that finance. You know, talking to one of the, uh, the people in the housing sector, you know, where people need new homes. Fundamentally, if we can help people do small little pieces themselves. So DIY, you see it with Grow Your Own is a very big movement down in Waterford. It's a really uh, fantastic, but they, they show people how to grow stuff. And they were asked specifically to come and, you know, build boxes for commercial entities. So this hotel wants, we want 20 boxes and we want radishes, we want cabbages, but they were like, no, we don't do it for you. Unless you do it yourself, you don't get the benefit of engaging with us. So we're looking at this model. Well, can we show simply, you know, through the media that we have available to us today, which I think is a hugely powerful tool that my grandfather would never have had. You know, my father didn't have when he was my age. We have it now. Like, what will our children have in terms of media to be able to influence the behavior change? 
So, for example, a simple practical logical piece here would be, you know, show people how to retrofit in attic insulation in their own attic. Like that's 30% of energy waste is through your attics. So if you show people and those who can will follow it, do it properly, don't do, you know, a, 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 a bad job, do it properly, take the time. But DIY, that empowers people, it gets more resources. It's not their everyday job. It's a couple of hours on a Saturday. They get it done. And then they realize maybe they can help some of their neighbors that, you know, we see it with the pandemic, with COVID. Neighbors came together. They brought food. They brought medicine to those who couldn't move out. You know, we can, as a people, can fundamentally, we see communities. I mean, tidy towns, litter picks, all this sort of stuff. That's And, and by touching and feeling an action, which has an impact, which it will have on their oil or future electricity bills, I think that is going to be the type of game changer that's going to see an engagement. And it's going to actually get things done with everybody being a part of it, as opposed to it being left to one-stop shop, turns up, does the job. We've become way too used to as a society of the one-minute dinner, not having to cook it ourselves, not having to do anything, pop it in the microwave, get out and eat it. And we all know it's not the best food. You should probably not be eating it, and you're not learning much by putting it into the microwave. So little things like that that I think all have a part to play. Paul, Paddy, I work, I guess, in a specific facet within the electricity sector working on the how. So today has been really valuable for me to learn more about the how in other areas of the energy industry, but I think very fundamentally to learn a lot about the why. And I think that's what continues to continues to inspire us in doing what we're doing. So, Paul, Paddy, thank you so much. It was great to chat to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.